Hey, thanks for watching. This quick video is on the evaporator, and the evaporator is uh, probably, I don't want to say it's the most important component because every component is critical to the operation of the basic refrigerant circuit, but it is the component that does the thing that we most uh, relate to with air conditioning and refrigeration, which is it is the part that absorbs heat. We would often think that the evaporator is the part that makes cold, but as often is is uh, you know beat to death in the HVAC industry, you can't make cold. Cold is the absence of heat or a differential between something that is hotter and something that is colder. It's an, it's an explanatory word that we use when we call something cold. We're just saying it's cold in relationship to the temperature of our skin or the temperature that we would like it to be outdoors or whatever the case may be. But the evaporator, for all intents and purposes, as far as we're concerned, is cold. If you touch most evaporator coils, they feel cold. On air conditioners, evaporator coils under normal sort of rated conditions are about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, that does vary depending on load conditions. And in freezers, you can get evaporator coils all the way down to minus, you know, 30, minus 40 degrees, depending on the, the situation. So we have evaporator coils that are uh, a wide range of temperatures, but they are all, almost all, <laughs> as far as we're concerned, cold. But when something is cold, that means it's a lower temperature than something else so that way heat moves into it which is why in my basic refrigeration description i talk about the evaporator as being the heat absorber it pulls in heat and that's really what we're trying to do when we're attempting to cool something is we make the evaporator coil of a lower temperature than either the room or the box the air going over it so that way heat goes out of that room or that refrigerator box or that freezer and the heat is attracted into that evaporator coil and often for most of the typical basic systems we're working on we're just flowing air over the evaporator coil over those fins on that evaporator coil and then as it passes across that metal and the refrigerant moves through it's absorbing heat through the metal into the refrigerant. The fins on those coils that you'll often see act as additional surface area to help give it a little bit more contact time so that as that air is passing over, it has more contact time on the metal so that way that refrigerant inside that evaporator coil can absorb heat. And we like we talked about before, the reason why the evaporator coil is cooler than, lower temperature than the other components is because there's a pressure drop right before it. We're going to talk about the metering device separately, but the metering device provides a pressure drop going into the evaporator coil and so that evaporator coil can be a lower temperature. The reason why we call it an evaporator coil is because the refrigerant inside boils or evaporates and those two words don't mean exactly the same thing. I would rather that it was called the boilerator instead of the evaporator um, but if you remember it as a boilerator that might help you remember what it does because what's going on inside there is the rapid change from liquid to vapor state. So it's, a, it's this change from liquid to vapor. Right when it comes out of that metering device it already has flashed off some of that refrigerant from liquid to vapor. A lot of time, a lot of uh, books will say, you know, approximately 70 to 30 percent. So 70 percent would be liquid, 30 percent would be vapor when it enters that evaporator coil. But that varies quite a bit. And there's a lot of conditions that impact that. But right as it enters the evaporator coil, it's automatically changing state and it's boiling. If you imagine what water looks like when it boils in a pot, that's very similar to what it's going to look like as it's flowing through the lines. It's, it's going to be that changing state. There's going to be, you know, bubbles forming in it as it's boiling, going through that evaporator coil. Now, that sort of blows our minds because we imagine that things that are boiling are hot. And the only reason we imagine that is because the only thing we observe boiling in our day-to-day -day lives is water. And water does boil at a high temperature compared to our skin at atmospheric pressure. 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius is what water boils at at atmospheric pressure. Whereas most of the refrigerants we work with, they boil at very low temperatures at atmospheric pressure. In fact, we have to kind of pressurize them above atmospheric pressure in order to manipulate them to boil at the temperatures that we want. So by manipulating the pressure, we can manipulate the temperature of that evaporator coil. You imagine this boiling refrigerant moving through it. We can manipulate the temperature at which it's changing state by manipulating the pressure. Like we talked about before, higher pressure pressure equals higher temperature, lower pressure equals lower temperature. And that's also true when you're dealing with what we would call a saturated refrigerant. That means that it's part liquid and part vapor together at the same place at the same time, otherwise known as boiling or condensing. Inside the evaporator coil, it's boiling. It's changing state from liquid to vapor, like I said, fairly rapidly as it circulates through the system. Now, just like uh, sort of the opposite of the condenser, where we talked about how the refrigerant goes in the top, and then as it becomes a liquid and kind of settles down, it goes down to the bottom. On an evaporator coil, we're generally going to feed it into the bottom, and then as it boils off to a vapor, it's going to come out the top. So generally, you'll notice that evaporator coils are fed with that boiling liquid refrigerant in the bottom, and then the refrigerant comes out the top and then feeds down. 
the suction line. It's very important in air conditioning that we control that temperature of the evaporator coil and keep it above the freezing temperature because most air conditioners don't have any way of defrosting. So we've got to keep that coil surface temperature above 32 degrees to ensure that we don't start to build up frost and ice. Now, in practicality, you can actually get it a little below 32 and not have frost because there's a slight difference between the temperature of the refrigerant inside the coil and the actual surface temperature of the metal on the coil. There's a slight variance there. And then also, you have to have sufficient moisture and sufficient dwell time in order for it to start to freeze. So that's why in a lot of arid environments, uh, people won't get the same types of frost patterns that we get down in Florida where we have very high relative humidity. And so there's different air flows that are needed and, and different circumstances. But regardless, we generally want to keep that evaporator coil above 32 degrees Fahrenheit so that we do not build up frost on that coil. Juxtapose that to say a freezer where we obviously have to get that evaporator coil below 32 degrees temperature. Otherwise, we would not get the product below 32. It wouldn't be a freezer unless it was below 32. In fact, a lot of freezers are minus 10, minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you have to have an evaporator coil that is lower than the temperature of that desired temperature of the box or of the product inside the box. So if you open up the freezer at home and let's say that it's minus 10 degrees inside that freezer, you have to have an evaporator coil that is at least minus nine degrees. Otherwise, heat isn't going to move out of that box into that evaporator coil. Like we said, the evaporator coil is the heat absorber and it must be lower temperature than the air that's passing over it or than the space that it's in, in the case of a, in the case of a freezer or a refrigerator. In, in practice, you're actually going to see more like a 10 to 20 degree lower temperature evaporator coil in those applications. Again, very much depends on the particular equipment in order to absorb heat out of that space effectively. So what we're doing with an evaporator coil, what we really care about is we care about making sure that we control the temperature to the temperature that we want that evaporator coil to be. And we also have to ensure that we flow refrigerant, that boiling liquid refrigerant through most of the coil. Now, the last part of the coil is what we call the superheating phase. If you remember what we talked about in the condenser, you have de-superheating, then you have condensing, the change of state from vapor to liquid, and then you have subcooling. And in an evaporator coil, you have the boiling phase or the flash gas or whatever you want to call it, the, the point at which it's changed changing state. It's saturated state. It's boiling. And then at the end, you have the superheating phase. Superheating can only happen when it is fully vapor. And as that refrigerant finally makes its way all the way through that coil, at the end, it's going to be fully vapor. And that's when we, when you get further on and you learn what superheat is, that's all superheat is. It's just using temperature and pressure in order to tell us how far through that evaporator coil that liquid refrigerant is boiling. So how long through that evaporator coil is there still some liquid? It's going to start off at, say, 70% liquid refrigerant, and then it's going to go to 60, 50, 40, 30, 10, and then finally it will go to 0% liquid refrigerant, and that's when we can start to superheat. That's when that temperature can start to rise. So we're going to control the temperature of that boiling through that evaporator coil through pressure. And then we're also going to control how far through the coil we're feeding the refrigerant. Now, everything in the air conditioning and refrigeration system affects everything else. So the amount of refrigerant, how well the compressor is moving that refrigerant, how well it's circulating it, if it's compressing properly, whether or not your condenser coil is dirty or has problems, or whether or not the airflow moving over that evaporator coil is too low. There's all kinds of factors that impact how an evaporator coil absorbs heat. But remember that when we're attempting to cool something, that really is the point. So it's very important that we get all of the situations correct so that way we have a proper evaporator temperature and so that way we're feeding that boiling liquid refrigerant through the bulk of that coil till we hit what we call our target superheat the point at which uh, it's it's designed to become a vapor before it goes back to that compressor again because that compressor is a vapor pump what's the point here the point is is that we have to control that temperature how far it feeds through one thing about the evaporator coil itself is that we are moving the right medium across it a medium can be air or water whatever it is that we're cooling and that we're moving it across in the correct rates so for example a really common example of this would be having a dirty air filter if you have a dirty air filter then there's not enough air moving over that evaporator coil that evaporator coil's job is to remove heat from the air. And if there's not enough air, then there's not enough heat and the pressure in that evaporator coil will begin to drop. And that's why you will find often that air conditioners that freeze up 
or even coolers or freezers that are freezing up too much, many times that's due to low airflow. So we have to control that airflow moving over that coil. If it was a chiller where it was cooling water, then you'd have to control the amount of water that was moving across it. Because remember, the evaporator's job is to absorb heat, so we have to give it the right amount of heat for it to absorb, for it to function properly. So that is just a very quick introduction. I could sit here and talk for hours about evaporator coils, but hopefully that gave you a sense of the evaporator coil, the heat absorbing component of the basic refrigerant circuit. We'll catch you on the next video.